good to have a chance to speak with you guys again. Uh, excited to share the things that we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, when I talked about the series yesterday and introduced it, I said if I were to sum it up in a way, it's, it would be a summary of the story. And I'd like to take the main points of Scripture, uh, the main part of, of God's plan, and kind of distill it down. And so last night we had two different examples where we took three chapters and were able to tell the story of God, the gospel story. It was summed up in three chapters. And we all probably could even do it shorter, right? I could tell you, if you just had one chapter to go to, what one chapter would you go to to explain uh, the gospel? And you probably could do it. On our next lesson, we'll pick, we'll show you how one chapter probably be the starting point for that. But what if I said, could you describe the gospel in one verse? And technically, I'm going to say two verses, I guess, today, just because we come in the middle of a sentence. But could you sum up the gospel in just one verse? Is there one verse in the Bible? And, and you have the, the PowerPoint up there. You see which verse I'm going to. First uh, Peter chapter 1. Uh, we are starting with verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. And I'm sure you've read over that a million times. And you're probably like, that's just that greeting, you know, these little greetings and closings. We're just reading someone else's mail. But I want you to take a closer look at that greeting. If you are very careful to notice, specifically in verse 2, we find every... Every party involved in our salvation, their role in the plan. Uh, notice, first of all, the Father. And this is why we had to go that one phrase in verse 1, but who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. That's God's role, right? He came up with the plan, and he chose us according to that plan. We notice also the Spirit, right? He says here, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit. The Spirit is not just holy himself as the Holy Spirit, but he's the one who makes us holy. Uh, so the Holy Spirit makes us holy. And, and we'll talk about that and what that looks like. Now, he talks about us next, right? But I'm going to skip back to Jesus um, as I read this, because it's all kind of in one sentence. But he says, um, <clears throat> to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. So we are sprinkled with his blood. He provides that cleansing blood. But what do we do? We obey him. That's everybody's role in the plan. And so to me, this is one of the coolest jumping off points. If you had just two verses, one verse to share with people, uh, go right there. And you have all the answers you need. Now this is something, by the way, this outlines the whole book of 1 Peter. I don't know if you ever noticed that before or not. But the book of 1 Peter is surrounds, okay, what was God's plan? And that's mainly chapters 1 and 2. Uh, it talks about, okay, now you've got to live a holy life. And it talks about how the, the word transforms your life and makes it holy. It talks about Jesus doing his, uh, his work with his blood. And that's actually the center point of the whole book. Uh, in, in Hebrew thinking, they had a, a structure that, it looks like the letter X. In a commentary, you'll hear it called chiastic, because that's the letter key, but it looks like an X. In the middle of the X is the most important point. The most important point of First Peter, written in a Hebrew style, is Jesus in the middle. Jesus was, uh, you know, the lamb that, like, went into the shears, it was silent, you know, and he, he gave his life for us. That's the middle of the book. So Jesus gave his blood, and what's our role? It's seen all throughout this, this book, it is to obey. Uh, so you can rattle it off right there. Four points, two verses, you've got it. But we're, we're going to spend a little more time talking about it tonight. Uh, but this is, uh, to me, we always make it too complicated. Uh, if you tell someone, oh, well, could you share the gospel with someone on a, a train ride, a plane ride, a bus ride, could you do it? And people panic. They're like, well, I would have to unteach them about this, and I'd have to, uh, I'd have to go through the prophets to get ready for this. And I, people come up with these complicated plans, but the actual gospel itself, the good news, is rather simple. Let's start with talking about God's foreknowing. Um, so uh, look actually a little bit further down in chapter 1, and we see a little bit more about God's great plan. In, in 1 Peter chapter 1, <clears throat> Actually, we're going to read these verses and refer to them a couple different times. We will start in verse 10 and read through verse 20. 
Uh, but as to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. So the prophets were giving you snippets here and there, bits of the mystery story, because God already had the plan made. And the prophets were like, well, how's this going to work out? What's our role in the plan? How's God going to solve the problem? And we see that, uh, as we talked about last night, it wasn't really for them, it was for us. But as we continue reading what it says here, uh, he says in verse 12, it was revealed to them they were not serving themselves but you in these things that have now been announced to you by those who preach the gospel, to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Do you see how everybody's roles are kind of mixed in here? The Holy Spirit's involved, um, and the message is about Jesus. God made the plan. The prophets taught us, and we obey it. As obedient children, do not be conformed to former lusts, which are yours in ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. If you address as Father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth knowing you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold from a feudal way of life inherited by your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. We'll come back to that in Jesus' role. But specifically look at verse 20. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. To me, that is a, a hard idea to wrap my head around. We all have a starting point. Now we know that we are uh, beings with an eternal soul and this life is not all there is, but we all had a starting point. There was a point when we were, you know, the old phrase that you were, you were a twinkle in your parents' eye or something, right? We weren't really here. We didn't exist. But then in that moment, uh, we became a life and we were here. But I, I can't really fathom something before time because I'm a creature that exists in time. I can't fathom a beginning before mine and a beginning before everybody's. In fact, before creation itself, God had already planned his great plan. Before the foundation of the world, before the world was created and even in, you know, he spoke it into existence. What an amazing thing that God set this in motion, not just before I was born, but before everybody was born. His, his knowledge of the plan and he didn't make a mistake. He knew all along what was going to happen. Um, we read in this reading a little bit in the middle of it there, it says that angels even long to look. The prophets wanted to know, what am I talking about here? And the angels were like, God, how are you going to do this? Satan surely had no idea. He was caught off guard. He thought he had won. But it was revealed to them and eventually to us, it was Jesus Christ. So we see here that this was planned all the way. But what was planned? Uh, a couple of things. Uh, he was actually planning to put Jesus to death. And to me, that, that's a sobering thought. Uh, and Jesus knew it. And he still chose to come here anyway. But from the very start, uh, Acts 2, which is a, a chapter you'll notice we're talking a lot about this week, because it's a great summary chapter, if you were to go and, and sum up the gospel plan. But in Acts chapter 2 and uh, verse 22... Notice this aspect of Peter's sermon. Men of Israel, um, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan, the foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. This was God's plan. It wasn't a mistake when Jesus went to the cross. It wasn't, oh no, he failed to set up a kingdom on earth, and so now they killed him. And he's going to have to come up with a backup plan. No, this was his plan, his predetermined plan from the beginning. Before the foundation of the world, he knew what he was going to do with Jesus, and Jesus knew what he was going to do willingly. But to me, it's even more exciting, because it wasn't just Jesus and his role in the plan that was predetermined. You know who else's role was predetermined? All of us believers. Uh, if you want to look real quick with me into Ephesians chapter 1, a passage where we not only learn that 
God gives us an inheritance, but we are actually God's inheritance. It's an exciting concept. But at the beginning of, of Ephesians chapter 1, and particularly verses 3 through 4, we realize that we've been a part of God's plan since before the foundation of the world too, since the beginning. In Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. Uh, and there's no good place to break that up. I, I feel bad for that. We talked last night about the, the writers who came up with uh, the chapter and verse definitions and all that. There's no good place to break it up. But we'll stop there with that concept, the idea that he chose us before the foundation of the world. It feels good to be chosen, doesn't it? Uh, I topped out at 5'7", but I was always the shortest in my class. And I picked last for dodgeball, picked last for baseball. I wasn't the worst, but I certainly wasn't the best. Um, and it feels bad to be chosen last, but it feels good to be chosen first, right? To be chosen to be... Uh, you know, teacher's helper that week or line leader or whatever you are when you're a little kid. And it feels good to be chosen to be student of the week or hero of the month or whatever. And we all like to be chosen for something. It starts at a young age and it goes on. We like to be chosen. And the idea that someone says, I always had you in mind for this job. God always had you in mind to be a holy, blameless child of his. Before the world even started, that was his plan for your life it kind of gives some new context to the Psalms, especially Psalm 139, when, when David talks about God had numbered all his steps before he was born, and he, he knew him as he formed him in the womb, and he had a plan for him. And that's why every life is precious, because God's got a, got a role, and before the world was created, he knew where you'd fit in the plan, and his plan for everybody was to be holy and blameless. Now, some of us mar that image. We ruin our purpose for ourselves, and we find some other purpose, uh, we got to get back to God's purpose for us, to be holy and blameless. But that was his purpose, was that Jesus be the sacrifice and that we be the holy, blameless children. That was God's role in the plan. What about the Spirit's sanctifying? You know, we call him the Holy Spirit because he is special or set apart, sanctified, unique, precious, holy, whatever words you want to put into that. Um, but... He was special, but his job is also making others the same as him, holy. Now, it's something that we have to be sanctified because we are not on our own holy. Uh, go back to 1 Peter and to some of the verses that we already read over again, but I want you to take note to this uh, about how he worked. Starting in verse 10, As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace to come... Uh, to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. The Spirit was talking about this plan and how he was going to make everybody holy ever since there's been prophets. Starting in Genesis 3 on, he's been making prophecies about how he's going to make people holy. And the Holy Spirit's been communicating that. He's been uh, giving people God's word. He did it on uh, Mount Sinai. He gave them a law that was supposed to teach them holy from uh, profane. And he's been doing it. That's his job. He makes us holy. And he works to make us even more holy, to understand what it is. Uh, notice, that's his, his work, right? He says... Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope on the, uh, completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is, this is his job, is to make us known in the plan and, and to let us know, okay, Jesus died for your sins. Here's what it means for you. And the spirit transforms your life. Now, there's plenty I don't understand about how the spirit works, um, but I know that he's always worked through communication. And through God's word. And I think there is some sense in which he absolutely dwells in us. I don't think he controls us in a way that we lose control of ourselves, But I do think he empowers us and enables us to live a holy life. And he teaches us what that looks like. And this is a, an idea seen all throughout scripture. Um, but this was what every prophet and apostle spoke about. Was God's plan to make people holy. 
and really faith in his revealed will is what leads to a changed life, a holy life. And can you live a holy life trusting in him if you've never learned the, the truth to begin with? The answer is no. You, you have to hear the word of God, which is delivered by the Spirit, to even understand that you need to be made holy or how that happens. And so without the Spirit's work, you couldn't be holy. Now, the question is, when does this happen? What does it look like? And like I said, I know there's some answers that aren't super clear, but I do believe there is some clear answers to this. Um, one of my favorite passages to talk about this, if you open your Bible to Titus chapter 3. In Titus chapter 3, <clears throat> well, actually, uh, we'll be using these verses again later in the lesson, so I'm going to start with verse 1, which talks about our changed holy behavior, and then we're going to learn the Holy Spirit's responsible for it, and we're going to learn when that process starts, right? So Titus chapter 3 and verse 1, remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. You might say to be holy, right? For we also were once foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of our God and Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds, which we've done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. Notice this, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The Holy Spirit is the one that cleans us up and makes us worthy of eternal life. We'll talk about that more tomorrow morning. But that is his chief work in making us holy, is getting to know God's will, God's plan, so that we can be made holy. And I think you have to be crazy to not see the ties between baptism and this. This is when it happens. That is the, the starting point to that cleaned up life, and that's not the end of his work. As long as you let the Spirit guide you and you bear the fruits of the Spirit and you're digging into his word and his communication, he's going to keep changing your life. And you're going to be growing more and more holy as you get to know him better. But that moment when we choose to put on Christ in baptism, we are also being washed and regenerated and renewed, renovated, restored, whatever word you want to put in there, by the Holy Spirit. I like the idea of a renovation. Um, there are people that spend all their life pretty much watching other people do renovations, right? They, they love those, um, those TV shows where they take this ugly, beat-up house, uh, but somehow the creator sees the vision, and, and they go in... And they don't bulldoze the house. I mean, there, there are some where they do that. But these renovation shows, they take the bones of the house and they restore it. They renovate it to what it was. And they see that potential when no one else does. And really, that's what God does. Right? He restores us back to our original glory. He makes us holy and ready for dwelling. And God's going to make his dwelling with us when he restores and renovates and you know, cleans us up. So what does it look like? It starts at baptism and it ends with us becoming like Christ. So you can say that it's no longer I who live, but Christ living in me. And so, yes, I'm living the life of Jeremy, but my actions, my thoughts, my speech, the way I behave are the actions of Christ. People see Christ living in me, it's because the Holy Spirit changed me, and I let him, and I let him in. So that's the Spirit sanctifying work in the plan We'll get to ours and we'll end with it, uh, even though technically in the passage we've been reading, ours comes first. But we're going to go back to Jesus. And I want to make simple definitions because people use the word Jesus Christ all the time and they think, sometimes kids even think that Christ is Jesus' last name. Um, and it's actually, sometimes adults do too. But as I re remind all of the kids' classes that I've ever taught, the word Christ means king. Uh, it, it means king. So I like calling him King Jesus, not just Jesus Christ. And there's nothing wrong with calling him Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus, but realize it's a title and not a name. And in our language, king, it, it makes it clearer to a lot of people. 
But King Jesus has a plan to clean us with his blood. His blood has been uh, sprinkled. Now, uh, it's interesting that multiple times in Peter's letter here, he refers to souls as precious. Um, he refers to in, in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 7, look at this, he says, So the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That, that our faith, you know, our, our, we're precious. Uh, the, the trust that we have in God. Um, chapter 3 and verse 4, when he's talking about what value, uh, what redeeming quality that a godly woman has, especially, particularly, being married to someone who doesn't support her in her faith. Chapter 3 and verse 4, let it be that hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. Souls are precious to God, and he cleans them up with the blood of his precious son. Uh, that goes back to what we already read, but we'll read it again in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. With precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Right? We weren't redeemed by gold and silver. You couldn't buy your salvation. You couldn't pay enough indulgences to make yourself right with God. But you were bought with something far more precious, the blood of Jesus Christ. It's precious because he is God. It's precious because he is divine. He is holy. He is unique. It's precious because he's God's only begotten. But it's precious because he's sinless. And spiritually, there was no flaw. There was no imperfection in his life, in his walk before God. And so his blood alone was precious enough to pay the price, to redeem us. Uh, and so that's the concept given in uh, Peter's letter here. And, and I'm always reminded of the statement made by the one who's preaching the lesson in the book of Hebrews. He says, it may also be said that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Now, they got acquainted with the shedding of blood, heavily so. There always had to be something being killed every day. And on special high holy days, like Passover, uh, it was said that the, the sewers that drained from the city would have been flowing with blood. Perhaps sometimes uh, 250,000 or more animals could be slaughtered on the same day. They had to come up with sewage uh, systems to handle the blood of the sacrifices going on. And think about it. From the time they consecrated the tabernacle, they had to sprinkle blood on the book and the people and the, the, the tent. Every time they got a new high priest, they had to sprinkle blood on everything. Once a year, the high priest had to sprinkle blood on everything inside the tabernacle. Without the shedding of blood, there was no forgiveness of sins. If you love God, just wanted to say thank you. You had to shed some blood. If you messed up and don't tell God you're sorry, you had to shed blood. If your baby was born, you had to shed blood. Everything in their law required the shedding of blood to make you holy and right with God. But there was that creeping, nagging feeling in the back of every Jewish believer that this isn't enough. That this is animal blood. They believed that God was going to wash away their sins and make them holy, but they knew there's something more that's got to be happening. And that was the precious blood of Jesus Christ himself. I'll never forget reading those words that John the Baptist says when he first sees him, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And there's no better description of Jesus. Uh, in the book of Revelation, John later goes on to describe Christians as those who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. He is that blood the source of blood, that we wash our robes white in. Because without his blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. In their day, there were people who said, maybe Jesus didn't really come in the flesh. They were the Antichrist, because literally the whole plan revolves around him actually having blood and shedding it. He didn't just appear to have come. He really did come. He really did go through what we read about in the Gospels. And there can be no cleansing without blood. So if he didn't come, we're all in trouble. But we know he did. And so when and where do we contact the blood of the Lamb? If, if that is the blood we need, and he says here, that is what you need to have fellowship with God. Once again, in the waters of baptism, Romans 6 tells us that if we want to have contact with the life of Jesus, we've also got to have contact with the death of Jesus. Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 1. 
What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Baptism is that moment. And for someone to say that baptism isn't necessary misses that point. If the blood of Jesus is necessary for the forgiveness of sins, we got to go where it is. And where is it? We contact it in the waters of baptism. He says, for if we become, uh, oh, sorry, in verse four, therefore we've been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so we'd no longer be slaves to sin. If you want to live with Jesus, you've got to die with Jesus. And there is no more dangerous doctrine than the popular one today that you come to Jesus as you are and stay as you are. There is literally nobody who can do that. And I've met people, they resisted it. They said, I feel like you're trying to change who I am. I said, yep. I feel like I'm losing myself. Yep. <laughs> That's the purpose. The gospel is about losing yourself so you can find Jesus. Amen. But we love ourself. We hold on to ourself and our sense of identity and who I am. And isn't that the highest God that people worship is their identity? And they focus on the identity of their family, uh, of their nationality, of their country and their flag, uh, the, the way they behave. You know, people are always looking for community and identity. But we are called upon as Christians to completely lose our identity, to die to self, and to raise to him. Worse yet, people today are proud to identify by their identity. And God says, forget who you are, be like me. Amen. Everybody. And so this isn't about, I'm telling you to stop being who you are alone because I don't like you. No, me too. I can't be like I am anymore. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And I contact that blood of Christ. i got to die so I can live. i got to raise again. Notice how these all happen at baptism. <laughs> You're added to the kingdom by God's plan when he chooses you. The Spirit sanctifies you, enables you, empowers you to live holy. Jesus, his blood washes you, that sprinkling of the blood. Don't resist his plan. Notice our role in this. We obey the king who brought his blood for a sacrifice to clean us up. We obey the spirit who's there to sanctify us and make us clean. We obey the father who chose us with his great plan. But people have problems with this. Well, they think that somehow, if you tell me I have to obey, that somehow I think I'm saving myself. Now, is it possible that Christians can become confused on this matter? Yeah. We can start to think, well, I come to church every time the doors are open, I read my Bible, I uh, do all these things. Maybe we sound like the publican, uh, or the Pharisee more than the publican, right? We say, I tithe this many times, I fast this many times, I give alms, look at me, God, I'm not like that guy. Maybe we do become that. But that's not because we obey. That's because we got a problem with arrogance and we got a problem with understanding God's role in the plan. Obeying is not the problem. In fact, obeying is necessary. Not because obeying saves us, but obeying is our part in the plan. And all of these parts work together to save us, right? Obeying is me submitting to his plan. So contrary to popular belief, we do have a part. People will say, there's absolutely nothing you can do to lose yourself or save yourself. God's already figured that out. Sometimes it's called eternal security. Sometimes it's called, uh, you know, once saved, always saved. There's all sorts of names for that kind of stuff. No, we have a role in the plan and obedience is necessary. Uh, later on in this same book that we've been in, do you notice what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4? The gospel is not just a good news a good news story, but 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17, he tells us, For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God, and if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? You say, wait a minute. If it's good news, how do you obey good news? But to obey the gospel, to obey the good news, means to follow up on your part in the plan. 
And this idea is not unique to Peter, but Paul writes the same thing to the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians 1, that, that flaming angels are going to come against in retribution against those who don't obey the gospel. Obedience is necessary. In fact, it is punishable by flaming death if you don't do it. So for someone to come along and say, obedience, our obedience doesn't matter, they miss so much of Scripture. Now, we do need to put our obedience into context. We ought not to think that I obeyed so perfectly that somehow I'm saved. But on the other hand, we also don't need to think, well, my obedience doesn't matter at all, and who cares? So does this mean we earn our salvation? Absolutely not. It says, though, that we are trusting in the Father's plan. We are trusting in the Son's blood. We are trusting in the Spirit's work to clean us up, that when we were baptized and all of those things happened, it really happened. It really worked. And that God is doing what he said he would do. It is in 1 Peter chapter 3 that we read in verse 21, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers have been subjected to him. This is the moment we ask God, clean me up according to your plan. It's the moment I submit my will to his when I obey, starting with baptism and every act of obedience after that. I'm asking him, clean me up. Make me holy. Make me yours. Back in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, what we had read earlier, did you notice this, what he says in verse 13? Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to former lusts, right? Our obedience is part of this plan. It's what God's always intended. That's part of what holy Christians look like. So, uh, it's my belief that works are a natural outgrowth of our part in the plan, of him offering to save us and, and doing his work, right? Uh, go back to Ephesians, a book we've already looked at, but uh, one chapter later, technically Ephesians 1 and 2 are really the same section, you know, going back to how those chapter divisions don't really work out great. But Ephesians chapter 2 is kind of close to the end of the discussion, started in chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 2 uh, really, verse 1 through 10 are all about this, but notice in verse 8, uh, Ephesians 2 and verse 8, For by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves it's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And people will stop there. And they say, see what that says? I did nothing. I'm not involved in my salvation at all. And my obedience doesn't matter a lick. Wait a minute, why'd you stop at verse 9? Verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so we would walk in them. So, no, my works don't save me, but my works are part of the plan. And God's plan was always to change me and make me useful so I can do something. And to leave works out of the plan misses that valuable point. Right? He saved me so that I could do good works. Titus 2 says the same thing, right? That's why... He showed his grace and mercy to me. That's why he changed me. Uh, I could go on and on all day long. But works and faith, there's no dichotomy. There's no fight. It was said that when uh, Luther made his translation of scriptures, he put the book of James at the end. He couldn't deny that it was inspired, but he also couldn't wrap his head around how someone could say works were necessary for salvation. So he just put it at the end. So he wouldn't have to think about it. But Paul and Peter never disagreed, and Paul and Peter and James never disagreed. They all agreed that yeah, God saves us by grace, and yeah, faith in Jesus saves us, and yeah, the Holy Spirit saves us, but works matter too, because that's my part in the plan, right? Notice that a changed life shows on the outside what happened on the inside at baptism. Now, I'm specifying that. It's not saying, I've already been saved, so now I live good works. Some people say baptism is the sign on the outside. No, no, no. You aren't saved, and then you get baptized. Remember, baptism's the moment I contact the blood of Christ. Baptism's the moment the Spirit cleans me up. Baptism's the moment I ask God, clean me according to your plan. I submit myself to your plan. So baptism is that first work of obedience that starts the life of obedience. 
Titus chapter 3, right? He even specified in that passage we read, you're not saved by your works, but you were cleaned up so you could do good works. And you were given the Holy Spirit so you could do good works. And he cleaned up your life so you could do good works. That's the plan. And I'll tell you, sometimes people say, so you're saying works are necessary for salvation. I say, no, I'm not saying that. I'm trying to get to the bottom of it. But works are necessary. Say, yep. And you try to wrap your mind around what they're saying. But then they really come back to this idea. And they say, so you're saying baptism. It must be a work. And so I've got to be baptized. So you're, you're saying, if you're guaranteeing that I've got to be baptized, you're saying I'm saved by works. And so sometimes I kind of mess around with them and I'll say, yeah, baptism is a work, and I'm saved by a work, but it's not my work. Have you ever brought them to Colossians chapter 2? I think Colossians 2 makes this the most clear. It is a work going on, but when I'm baptized, who's doing the work? In Colossians chapter 2, and starting in verse 9, just to give it a little context, for in him, that being Jesus Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. In him you've been made complete. He's the head over all rule and authority. In him you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands and the removal of the body by flesh of the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism through which you were also raised up with him through the faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So is baptism a work? I got no problem calling it a work. Who's doing the work? He's very clear in that passage. When I choose to be baptized, it's not my work that saves me, but it's me trusting in God's working, right? You know, one of your members had surgery. I don't know the nature of that surgery, but I do know he didn't do it on himself. That's something that doesn't happen, right? The Old Testament refers to what's going to happen when you become a Christian as a heart surgery, that God's going to remove a heart of stone and put it in a heart of flesh. David talks about creating me a new heart, right? I've never met somebody who could do their own heart surgery. I don't care if you're the best cardiologist that's ever existed, the best surgeon that's ever existed. So is the surgery a work? Absolutely. But, and it takes me trusting, and i got to sign over those consent forms. But I didn't replace my own heart. God did that. So when someone says, yeah, baptism is a work, yeah, but it's not my work. It's me trusting in God's work to save me. And the point may not seem huge, but it is. So yeah, baptism is absolutely necessary because that's the moment God says, that's when I clean you up. And you can't say, I don't need that. When Peter says, baptism now saves you. And Paul says, you're buried in his death and raised in his life. When Paul in Colossians here says, that's when God does his work, removing the old self and putting in the new self. So obeying is my part in the plan. So I hope this has been a helpful way to think about it, uh, made it more clear, uh, or maybe just given you some verses that you're a reminder of things you already knew that will enable you to go out and explain these things to others. But if you ever want a summary uh, of God's plan and everybody's role in it, uh, just remember the two verses in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, that we are saved by God's choosing us and his knowing than the plan. He knew Jesus would be the sacrifice and he knew we would be children of his to walk blameless. We got the Spirit who does the sanctifying work in the plan. Jesus Christ provided the holy blood that was sprinkling, the, the precious blood of the Lamb, and we do the obey. And that is how we are saved. Uh, we'll uh, have our intermission and then uh, continue with our study in a little bit.